we're very fortunate to have someone as distinguished as Professor Horvitz here with us today. Uh, the issues he will be discussing, um, world peace, biomedical sciences, and uh, world health are issues that are highly pertinent in the world today, and we are very lucky to have an, a, a, such a uh, leader in these fields um, to give us a brief uh, talk about it today. Professor Horvitz uh, developed an early interest in the sciences, um, aided and fostered by his parents. Uh, he attended the Massachusetts Institute of Technology as an undergraduate uh, and graduated in 1968 with a bachelor's degree in economics and in mathematics. But only in his senior year did he discover his passion for biology. He was fascinated by the subject and decided that even with only a few weeks experience, he, to apply for graduate school at Harvard, which he, uh, for, to continue his education in biology. Even though he started at graduate school behind his classmates because of his late start, through determination and effort, he succeeded and managed to excel, gaining a master's degree in 1972 and a PhD in 1974. Professor Horvitz's sudden change and subsequent success shows that it is never too late for us to start anew and pursue a new passion or interest. He's worked at MIT since 1978, first as an assistant professor, but after 1981 as an associate professor, and 1986 as a full professor. He's presently David H. Koch Professor of Biology at MIT, a member of the McGovern Institute for Brain Research, and a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He has won numerous awards in genetics, neuroscience, and cancer research, but the most prominent of his awards uh, was the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 2002, which he won alongside John Salston and Sidney Brenner. This was for work on um, how genes affect the development of organs and, uh, pro and how they affect the program Death of Cells, which is an important part in the growth and development of organisms. His contribution was in the discovery of two genes that directly relate to cell death in Cyanorhabditis elegans, a Chinese transparent roundworm, and his discovery of how these genes interact with other genes and their equivalents in larger organisms such as humans. His research was particularly significant and has many uh, possible future implications, such as um, uh, in the future cure of cancer, for example, and also because of the use of uh, Cyanorhabditis elegans, which has become a model lab animal, which has been used for all sorts of research and investigation uh, since then. He continues to contribute significantly to the sciences and recently discovered a gene that plays a major role in the development of uh, amythro um, sorry, I can't pass. amythropic lateral sclerosis, which is a deadly neurodegenerative dis disorder that results in a person slowly losing control of the muscles in their body. Though most of Professor Horvitz's achievements have been in the sciences, he has also has numerous other accomplishments. He both edited and wrote for his high school newspaper and MIT's student newspaper, The Tech. During his, during his undergraduate years, he also played an important part in the MIT student government, forcing the concerns of the student body to the school administration. We are very fortunate to have such a distinguished and uniquely qualified individual talking to us today. And I would re sincerely like to thank Professor Horwich for taking his time to talk to us, and I hope we all learned something from this talk today. Thank you. That was an excellent and remarkably accurate introduction. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm here today not to give a lecture, but rather, and so I'll make a, a few words of introduction, but what I'm really hoping, um, I guess the first thing I'm hoping is, can we turn more lights on? Because as I look out, uh, it's, it's kind of dark out there. And I'd like, to be able, I'd like to be able to see everybody uh, 
as we, as we have this conversation. So what I'm hoping is that after I, I make a few brief remarks, uh, that, that you'll ask me questions about anything that comes to mind. And uh, I can't promise answers, but I can promise responses. Um, so it's a, it's a great privilege to be here. I, I find that one of the things I do that, that's most exciting and gratifying is to talk to young people um, who are at your stage of development. Uh, I've been involved in the United States uh, with the Intel Science Fair, uh, which involves high school students, and some of the students get to go to international competitions. And uh, I've enjoyed my conversations with, with these students very much. Uh, I recently met with a group of students in Stockholm in Sweden. And I also have a daughter who is, um, I would say, 15 going on 25. And probably all of you know what that means. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd basically make some rem remarks now divided into, into three different sections. Uh, one is a little bit about my personal history, focusing on, on some people and events that I think really provided my inspiration uh, to try to do well in, in, in whatever it was I was going to do, and particularly help guide me into the area of science. Secondly, I'll say a little bit uh, about the science itself, um, but mostly in the context of trying to offer some messages from my experiences that maybe will be of interest and, and possibly some relevance uh, to you. So I grew up in the United States. Uh, my home is Chicago. Chicago is in the middle of the country. Uh, my parents, Oscar and Mary Horvitz, also were both born in Chicago. So I was very much um, a Chicago native. Uh, my father's real dream was to be a chemist. Actually, I think his real dream was to be a professional baseball player. But secondarily to that, it was to be a chemist. But he didn't have enough money. This was the time of the Depression. He didn't have enough money to go to school and study chemistry. And his eyes were not good enough to be a professional baseball player. And in fact, he couldn't afford a pair of glasses. And uh, at one point in his schooling, one of his teachers gave him a pair of glasses to use so he could read. And so he really didn't have an opportunity financially to do anything other than go to work. And he did so. He became an accountant and uh, really was very involved then in financial aspects of, of business. My mother uh, was a teacher. Uh, she taught elementary school. She was trained in English, and she taught English at first, and then somehow she evolved from teaching English to teaching math and science. And I, I think it was the combined influence of my, my father, and my father really loved numbers. He didn't become an accountant uh, because he wanted to make money. He became an accountant because he just liked playing with numbers. And, and that play was, was always very present in my life. And my mother was interested in math and science. So at home, I saw math, I saw numbers, and I saw science. And I think I very much grew, grew up with that. And, and that helped set the stage for my career. But what I think was more, more important than those specifics is the fact that I, I always felt that my parents, both of my parents, loved and respected knowledge. And, and learning, and, and always really helped me to learn to ask questions. Um, school wasn't to memorize. School was to know how to think about things in the world and, and to ask about, about the world uh, around me. And they also clearly loved me and, and really supported and encouraged me in everything I did. Um, except sometimes when uh, perhaps what I did wasn't totally appropriate. But even then, when I got in trouble, uh, I knew I did have their love and support. Um, as I grew up, I participated in various science fair projects. In fact, when I was 14, 
I did a science fair project in the area of genetics, which some years later became basically the focus of my professional interest. But I have to say it was not a direct route from age 14 uh, to being a professor of genetics. And, and to be brief, and, and you've heard a little bit about it, uh, after high school I went to university at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near Boston. Um, I received two degrees, one was in theoretical mathematics and the other was in economics. And I had planned to go to law school and, and be a lawyer, but during my last year of study, a roommate suggested I try a course in biology. What, what he said to me was, biology has become interesting. So I said, okay, I'll try that. And, and I took the course, I, I liked the course, and um, as you heard in the introductory comments, um, just a few weeks into the course, it was my last year as, as a university student, uh, I decided, well, m maybe I should think about doing this you know, further and, and go to graduate school in this area. And I went to the professor who was teaching the course and I said, Dr. Leventhal, um, I've taken six weeks of your introductory biology course and I'm thinking about going into the field of biology, but my major, I have two majors, one's mathematics, one's economics, am I too late? And what he said to me was, my undergraduate major was physics. My PhD is in physics. You're starting early, okay? So I think that was a pretty striking message and I took him to heart. I went to graduate school in biology and, and I guess I've been a biologist ever since. Um, I did my PhD studies with two advisors. One was James Watson, and if you've heard of the double helix and Watson and Crick, this is the Watson of Watson and Crick. And also with uh, Wally Gilbert, and Wally Gilbert is one of the people who developed methods for determining the sequence of DNA, and you may have heard of the Human Genome Project, which is you know, based upon sequencing DNA. And both, both Jim and Wally um, are Nobel laureates. So I had a pretty, I'd say a pretty good training with the two of them. Then from Harvard, I moved to Cambridge, England, and I, I worked there with the, the two people you heard about a moment ago, John Selsted and Sidney Brenner. And it was there that I began the work that led to the Nobel Prize. And in fact, the three of us worked together and, and shared this prize. And the prize was for work uh, that was focused in part upon discoveries of a phenomenon known as programmed cell death. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about programmed cell death just so you can understand what, what the science was about. Um, what's meant by programmed cell death is cell death that occurs naturally. Okay, so you, you may know a little bit about genes and cells. I'm not sure how much of this students are exposed to here, but some of you may, may know about it. Um, genes are basically responsible for our heredity. Each of us has uh, half of our genes from our mother and half from our father, and it's what makes a child resemble its parents. It what it's what makes us all look human as opposed to looking like some other creature. Um, so genes really are, are the essence of heredity. And uh, a cell is the unit of life. We're made up of cells, lots of cells, lots of different kinds of cells, blood cells, skin cells, muscle cells, nerve cells. And what, what we basically worked on was the relationship between genes and cells and a phenomenon called programmed cell death. And what programmed cell death means is that some of the cells in our bodies, instead of doing specialized things, like, like our nerve cells talk to each other and help us to move and to think, uh, and in our muscle cells certainly are involved in body movements, our blood cells get oxygen to our bodies, some of the cells that, that we make don't do any of these things. They simply die. Okay, so that seems very 
strange. Why in the world do we bother to make cells that die? And, and how, how is it that cells sometimes do die? Well, it turns out that, that there are lots of examples of cells dying in biology. And you, you probably know some of these, although you may not have called it that. If you think about what happens when a frog becomes a frog from a tadpole and the, and the tadpole loses its tail, the tail is made up of cells and those cells die and they die by this phenomenon known as programmed cell death. If you think about birds and, and think about bird feet, some bird feet are webbed, some bird feet are not webbed. The, the web birds obviously use the web feet for, for swimming. And the difference is that in those birds that don't have web feet, there is a webbing that's generated. And then it's sculpted out because the cells in that webbed area undergo programmed cell death. So there's a lot of programmed cell death in biology. There's a lot of programmed cell death in us when our brains form. Many of the nerve cells that are generated don't ever really become final neurons and, and instead they die. In our immune systems, many of the cells in our blood that are generated die. And, and we could talk at some length about the biology and why this is, but it's a very widespread uh, phenomenon. And it, it turns out, and it shouldn't be surprising, that any bit of our biology, if it goes wrong, can lead to disease. So many of the diseases you know about actually turn out to be diseases in which programmed cell death goes wrong. Some of this can be easy to see. Um, if we have cells that are supposed to do something in our bodies and those cells die, obviously we're gonna have a deficit. So that, for example, in certain kinds of blindness, cells in our eyes die, and that's why we can't see. And they die by programmed cell death. When somebody has a heart attack, cells in the heart die, and they die by programmed cell death. When uh, somebody's liver is infected with hepatitis C virus, cells in the liver die and they die by programmed cell death. So what's happening in these and many other diseases is that this, this program for cell death that's normally used to help us develop and, and make the cells and structures that we have, it's unleashed at the wrong time. And, and that causes cells to die. And that causes disease. There also are diseases in which there's too little cell death, okay? And cancer is an example. Okay, we always think about cancer as cells dividing and dividing and dividing and making too many cells. And that's true, but it's only half the story. Um, if you think about the number of cells in a tissue in your bodies, that number is, is defined by two opposing processes. Cells are being added, and by cell division, and cells are being taken away by cell death. And if you add too rapidly, you can get a cancerous growth, but if you take away too slowly, you can also have an increase of cell number. It's like, think about a bathtub. Okay, so take a bathtub and fill it half full of water, and then you turn on the faucet, so water is coming in, and you have a drain, and you set the faucet so the water is coming in at exactly the rate the drain is allowing the water to flow out. And then the level of water in the bathtub will be constant, even though water is always coming in and water is always going out. If you turned up the faucet, the bathtub would overflow. Okay, that's cancer. If you slightly plug the drain so that the water is flowing out too slowly, the bathtub would also overflow. That's also a basis for cancer. And it turns out that some cancers are much more a disease of too little cell death than they are a disease of too much cell division. And all cancers seem to involve too little cell death. 
So this phenomenon in biology is important not only for basic biology, but very much also for human disease. And so the question then was, how does it work? What, what's going on? How, does, how, how do cells die by programmed cell death? And this is what the three of us did in, in our scientific studies. And we didn't study people. Okay, people are complicated. Um, I'm sure that much is, is pretty clear. But we studied an experimental organism. And the animal we studied is actually a microscopic worm, a round worm, that's only one millimeter in length. And you can grow it uh, like one would grow bacteria on, on little glass or plastic petri plates. And you can grow 10,000 of them in a single petri plate. And you can study them in much detail and a lot more easily than you can study bigger animals. And these animals have programmed cell death. So what we did was we studied programmed cell death in this very simple worm, figured out using genetics uh, which genes were involved and how the genes interact. And then through our work and also work of the field more generally, discovered that the genes we had identified and the ways in which these genes work were not unique to this little worm, but also were essentially the same in all animals, including human beings. Okay. So that meant that we had established a, a pathway of genes for programmed cell death. Now, given that, and given what I told you a few moments ago about the importance of programmed cell death and disease, these genes then became targets for therapeutic intervention. So for example, think about a disease in which there's too much cell death. You go blind because cells in your eye are dying. If you could block that death, then you could treat that disease or prevent that disease. And so what the pharmaceutical industry has been doing since our discoveries is working to identify molecules that can be drugs that block killer genes and thereby prevent cell death and can be used to treat diseases like neurodegenerative diseases or heart attacks or liver disease and so on. And then there are other molecules that are developed that act the opposite way and they activate cell death instead of stopping cell death. And if you could activate cell death, for example, in cancer and cause cancer cells to die, you could treat cancer. Okay? And those molecules also are being developed and there are now a large number of these kinds of drugs that are being developed clinically in, in, a, in a variety of different biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies throughout the world based upon the science that was learned from studies of this tiny worm. Okay? And, and obviously the, the hope is that these molecules will continue through clinical trials. They're currently being tried in patients today. will continue through clinical trials and uh, become very useful drugs for a variety of different diseases. Okay, so having said that, let me just make a couple of comments um, that I would say I would generalize from, from my life in science so far. Um, first of all, science itself is a team endeavor. I may have shared a Nobel Prize with two friends. But there were many more than two of us who were involved in the science that was recognized uh, by this prize. Um, I, I was very fortunate to have outstanding teachers and mentors. And, and so my advice to you would be choose wisely your teachers. Um, choose wisely those from whom uh, you get advice. And, and listen to that advice uh, and, and judge it appropriately. I also uh, have been very lucky to have outstanding students work with me. 
I've had students at a variety of levels of training from post-PhD researchers to PhD students to undergraduate students and even on occasion some high school students have worked in my laboratory. And I have to say that it's really been the young investigators who have made the most pivotal discoveries in terms of, of the efforts that, that I've been involved with over the years. A second thing that I would say is that the research that we did was very basic research. When we started studying, we, we didn't target a disease. We weren't trying to cure blindness. We were simply trying to explore the unknown. We were trying to look at a problem in biology that hadn't been studied in detail before and see if we could learn something new. And by doing that, uh, we learned something that not only was new in biology, but also seems to have a large amount of, of practical import. So there's, there's really a message here about, about science and, and about medicine and, and probably more generally about innovation and progress. And that is, if you do something uh, that's important and that's different and you do it well and you really dedicate yourselves to it, you're going to make a contribution. And, and I think that's something very important to keep in mind. And, and I guess the third message I would have from, from my experiences is one we heard about in the introduction. And that is, don't be afraid to try something new. If even as I was finishing as, as a university student, uh, I said, okay, well, I'm a mathematician. Well, actually, I wasn't a mathematician because I knew mathematicians and they were much better at math than I was. Um, but I was a mathematics major, um, I was an economics major, and if I had said, well, that's my label, and that's what I'm going to do, I would never have moved into biology. Um, I switched fields and did something that was completely different from what I had been doing before. And I did that because I got the good advice from one of my teachers to not be afraid. And so I would pass that advice on to you. Don't be afraid of doing something new. Follow your hearts. If there's something that's inside you that you're interested in, um, that's what you ought to do. And if you change your mind later, then you should do something different at a later stage. Don't feel you know, that you have to do whatever it is, quote, you're in the process already of doing or what others are expecting from you. Follow your own passions and do whatever you do well and uh, then I think you'll get the most out of whatever it is you dedicate yourselves to. So that's just a few introductory comments and I'm, I'm hoping that with that now um, you will not be bashful. Um, if, if, if the group is too bashful, I'll just look around and point at somebody and say, okay, what do you think? Um, don't be bashful. Ask me questions. Um, share with me your own, you know, your own experiences, opinions, and let's have a conversation. So, anybody? Very bashful. Yes, okay, some questions are coming up. Good. Um, do you feel that the um, failure to better um, stop diseases and cancer in the world has been like um, more the result of a lack of technology or the lack of implementation. Okay, so why haven't we cured cancer? Right? Yeah. And uh, th that's a complicated question, and let me, let me start with a, a number of responses. One is cancer is not a disease. Cancer is a large variety of diseases. There are different cancers, 
and we sometimes talk about them by the tissues that they affect, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, but they're more fundamentally different than that. They're different in their biologies, and even any individual cancer, breast cancer, um, isn't a single entity biologically. There are different ways to get to the disease that we call cancer or even the disease that we call breast cancers. So there are a huge multiplicity of, of disorders and to really attack them, we need to understand the biologies of all of these different diseases. Now, the fact is that we've made enormous progress in treating and in some cases even curing certain cancers. There are childhood cancers, certain childhood leukemias, uh, and other, other cancers uh, for which the treatments that have been developed over the last 15, 20 years have really been outstanding. There are other cancers uh, which are being treated today with novel methods that derive straight from the field of biology so that, for example, um, there are uh, what are called biologics. So mostly when you take a pill to treat anything, you're taking a pill that contains some small molecule that intervenes in the biology that's responsible for disease. But the biologics are not small molecules, these little chemicals of, of molecular weight 500 or so, but they're much larger molecules. They're molecules like proteins that are huge by comparison and the, the modern biological studies have developed a variety of proteins, growth factors, antibodies that can be used to treat disease and some of them are being used to treat cancers. Uh, in general, they're not magic bullets. They don't cure the disease and in fact their effects are disappointingly limited but nonetheless real and meaningful, um, but there's progress there. So the, the, answer, the answer is that there has been progress. Uh, the progress has been very real. It has impacted the lives of many, many people, but there also is a long way to go. And what's gonna be needed for, for the progress to continue and, and really to control cancer, whether or not we'll be able to cure all cancers, I don't know, but I do think we'll be able to control cancers uh, much more than we can now. And I think that will be a combination of the science and the technology, both. It's not an either or. We need more scientific knowledge to understand what processes are going wrong in cells to lead to cancer. We know a lot about it, much more than we did not very many years ago, but there's still a lot we don't know. And also we do need better technologies. And, and these technologies are, are being developed and some of them come from biology, some of them come, uh, come from engineering, some of them actually come from computer science because part of understanding a disease process requires dealing with vast amounts of information and people are using computer science in new ways to, to analyze data uh, on very, very large scales. And so one thing I would say is, is that when one thinks about medicine, be it cancer or any other disease, um, today we no longer separate fields as much as they've been separated in the past. You might think that the study of medicine, you want to study disease, and then biology is something more abstract, and chemistry is unrelated, and mathematics has nothing to do with And that's not true. If I think about biomedicine today, um, somebody who is really, really expert um, knows or interacts with people in clinical medicine, biology, chemistry, mathematics, sometimes even physics, and certainly engineers. And that combination of fields, um, I think, will help spear more technological innovation and combined with the biological advances, I, I, I think will make a big difference. I have a question about um, stem cells. Like, I was wondering, do you think in the near future we'll be able to, let's say, investigate um, stem cells as much as you have with um, um, the, death, the death cell? 
right? Um, if in the near future we'll be able to tackle diseases and like such problems with health through stem cell research. I, I think stem cells are extremely promising. So just in case not everybody knows what a stem cell is, um, when, when an animal develops, you, we all, all of us, started as a single cell, a fertilized egg, and that cell divides and divides and divides to make a lot of cells, and then each of those cells take on particular characteristics, nerve cells, blood cells, muscle cells, skin cells, and so on. And uh, the stem cells are basically cells that have the potential to divide and, quote, differentiate into many different cell types. In fact, the ultimate stem cell can differentiate into any cell type. So the idea of using stem cells, and particularly human embryonic stem cells um, in medicine, is that you can take a cell that you can grow and study in a test tube or in a Petri plate and put it in a patient and use it to replace disease cells. So that, for example, in, in a patient with a heart attack, you might replace heart cells. Or a patient with diabetes, you might replace the pancreatic cells, cells of the pancreas that haven't worked. Or in a cancer patient, you might replace cells in the bone marrow. Or in a patient who has um, had spinal cord injury, falling off a motorcycle and, and damaging your nervous system, you might re be able to replace nerve cells that have been damaged by introducing stem cells and causing them to differentiate in the appropriate way as, as replacement. And I think stem cells offer enormous potential uh, to, to do these kinds of things. In addition, uh, stem cells are actually useful um, in ways beyond that because the stem, stem cell therapies, uh, uh, as I've just described, um, are, are still pretty much a dream. Nobody has cured a patient with stem cells yet that I'm aware of, although things are beginning to be tried in, in a variety of countries uh, for a variety of, of different diseases. But it's still early days. But stem cells are also enormously important uh, to understand basic biology. And I hope with the remarks I made before, um, you can see that I believe that if you understand basic biology, you can make inroads towards disease. And it may be that the most powerful uh, use of stem cells, at least initially, won't be as therapies themselves, but rather as a route to understanding. So that if you can take a cell and study what is needed to make it go from being this totipotent cell capable of generating all these different cell types to a particular nerve cell type, if you can understand that biology, you might be able to use that knowledge in yet a different way to treat disease. So stem cells may be good themselves as therapies. Uh, they also will be important in terms of learning about the basic biology. In addition, uh, there, there are ways of using stem cell technology that can be even more powerful. So that, for example, if you think about taking a stem cell, okay, some cell that's being grown in a Petri plate, and putting it into a patient to treat any of the diseases that I described, most of the time what's going to happen is that that cell's going to be rejected. Because our bodies are exquisitely sophisticated to recognize foreign invaders and destroy them. So if there's a bacterium or a virus that infects our bodies, our bodies have an immune system that recognize those foreign bodies and, and get rid of them. Okay. If we put in a cell that's been grown in the Petri plate from somebody else, in general, our bodies are going to recognize those cells as non-self and destroy them. So it becomes difficult to try to circumvent that rejection process. Um, some drugs are used to, to reduce the rejection process, but they themselves can be toxic. Uh, they also make, make you susceptible to infection. 
Um, so another use of stem cells involves a process that's called um, nuclear transfer. And, and what's done here is you take an egg cell and you eliminate its nucleus and then you put in a nucleus from a body cell. So let's say you, you have uh, a disease and you have disease cells in one tissue, but the rest of your body cells are perfectly fine. We might be able to take an egg cell, take a nucleus, for example, from a skin cell of your own, put it into the egg cell, make that into a stem cell, and then use that stem cell to generate, for example, cells for your bone marrow to replace missing cells that are, are def deficient because, because of a cancer or something. And then those cells will have a nucleus with the DNA from your own body, and they won't be rejected. And that is an extremely powerful uh, approach to therapy. So there are actually three different ways that stem cells can be useful uh, scientifically and medically. One is direct therapies, two is through nuclear transplant to avoid the problem of rejection, and three is through biology itself. And I believe all of these are very, very interesting and, and very exciting avenues. And in fact, you, you may have read in the paper that last week, a week ago Monday, um, in the U.S. in Washington, President Obama signed an executive order authorizing now the study of stem cells in the U.S. in a way that previously had been prohibited. And I, I think this authorization is extremely important. And, and I can tell you that I was there for that signing with the president. And it was a very exciting day because I think many of us believe that the short answer to your question is, yes, stem cells will prove to be important. Um, uh, so, uh, Professor, um, what do you think is uh, probably the most prominent development in uh, biomedical sciences and medicine uh, today? Um, the most prominent oh, okay. development. The most promising. In, uh, most, most promising. promising. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I think that one of the most exciting areas has to do with genomics and personalized medicine. Okay. And this actually relates, I, I can relate it, I mean it's very much more general than this, but I can relate it uh, to the comments I made before about cancer. Um, right now, the drug companies develop drugs and they need drugs that have two major properties. One is they have to work to combat disease, and two is they have to not be so toxic that they kill their patients for another, in another way. Okay. And this is a very complicated balance because when you start putting foreign compounds into the body, they do a variety of different things. More than that, different people respond differently. So a dose of a given drug that may cure you could kill me. If we could find out ahead of time how susceptible each of us is likely to be um, to a, a given drug, are we going to respond, each of us, positively to the drug? In other words, if we took it, would it work for the disease? Are we going to respond negatively? If we took it, would it kill us? If we could find that out ahead of time, and then design and use drugs in a much more personalized way based upon our own biologies, we would have much more powerful approaches to medicine. And this, this whole field is called the field of personalized medicine. And much of what's being done in personalized medicine is taking advantage of the discoveries that have been made in the Human Genome Project, where we now know all of the genes of, you know, that we carry, and we can compare them, each of us to each of the others. And the, the goal, the vision, the dream, is that by comparing our genomes, our, our DNA, 
we will be able, as we learn more, to distinguish amongst us which of us is going to be most likely to respond in a good way, which of us is most likely to respond in a bad way to each of a large variety of different drugs. And I think personalized medicine of this sort, as the science develops and as the costs become reduced, uh, could really have a revolutionary effect on, on the way we treat patients. Okay, some more questions? Hi. Um, do you think we'll be able to stop the HIV virus? And what's your attitude towards the Pope's disagreement of the use of um, contraception? Um, okay, so we'll, can we control AIDS and stop the HIV virus? And, and the answer is, of course, we're doing much better now than we did not so many years ago. Uh, there are inhibitors, and again, this came straight from the science. Uh, the study of the HIV virus proceeded quite rapidly because of what was known about related viruses. And then, although, although it took a while to, to really develop some drugs, drugs were developed that were directed against particular proteins that are made by that virus that are key for the life cycle of that virus. So the control now is something. I mean, it used to be nothing whatsoever. Um, it's not as good as we want it to be. And one of the, one of the real dreams for, for AIDS is to have a vaccine uh, against the virus. Um, that vaccine has been very difficult to obtain. There has not been a success as yet. Many people and many companies have worked at it. Um, there are always new ideas and new approaches and I, I think the hope is that that will succeed, but it's been, it's been tough. Um, in, in terms of contraception, uh, my, my own feeling is that contraception is very important, uh, both to prevent unwanted pregnancies and births, uh, and also to prevent the spread of disease. And I, for, for me, that's a very simple question. Um, obviously, when, when issues interface with uh, religious beliefs, then there are very strong individual beliefs uh, that have to be considered. And so when I say that, I say that not that it's necessarily the right answer for everybody, uh, but from my own personal convictions, uh, it's, it's the way I believe I would like to, to see things done. For, this is relating to stem cell research. Um, if stem cells are used for the common good of the society, why do you think federal agencies, um, federal drug agencies such as the one in Thailand have not approved of it yet? Um, okay, so, so what are the issues around stem cells? And, and there, there are a number. First, uh, approving stem cells for the clinic, like any other process, procedure that's done clinically um, has to be reviewed by appropriate agencies and, and considered to be both efficacious, i.e. it should work, and two, it should be safe. And so far in the U.S. at least, there's only been one procedure that has been approved for stem cells and that has to do with spinal cord injury and that was very recent, simply because there haven't been enough scientific data for things to go far enough. So that's with respect to, to approval for procedures that can be, can be used clinically. Uh, I think it's still early days in terms of the development of these clinical procedures. But there are other issues and arguments that have been waged around stem cells. Um, most simply, stem cells are called the, the ones that have, have been controversial are called human embryonic stem cells. And there, there are people who believe that using cells from embryos is immoral. 
and there's been a lot of discussion of, of this ethical issue. Um, there are views on both sides, and again, sometimes religion it plays a major role in, in the views that individuals have. But one thing to keep in mind, uh, at least in the US, is that the source, the major source of uh, human embryonic stem cells is frozen fetuses, frozen, uh, actually they're, they're you know, the, the, the cells come from these little balls that have been generated by fertilized eggs. And they, they are obtained from uh, in vitro fertilization clinics where people have come because they want to have children and uh, they're making uh, fertilized eggs that then could be implanted into a, into a woman and develop into, into a baby. So people say, well, you, you don't want to use those for experimentation. But what's going on now is that there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these embryos that are generated. Um, the vast majority of these are simply thrown away. They're literally flushed down the toilet. And they're being discarded anyway. Uh, and the question is, well, if they're being discarded anyway, is there something that can be done with them that would be useful and not ethically uh, uh, disconcerting. So the, the answer I think that a lot of people feel is that if you can use these cells and study them in ways that can cure human beings, uh, and they're going to be thrown out anyway, uh, the balance between the two sounds like maybe you want to study them. Now you don't want to study them to, to an extent that you're doing something that is destroying a human. So the question is, when does a cell become a human? Well, we can scrape a cell off of our skin, and it has a nucleus in it, it has a DNA in it, and it has all the potential to, to form a human being, particularly if we took that nucleus and transferred it appropriately. And uh, these, these balls of cells that are studied are basically very much the same. They are cells. They have a potential only if they are transferred to a mother who then, then allows them to develop. And they're fundamentally not different from cells you might scrape off your skin or get from inside your cheek or any place else. So I think for a lot of people, the real ethical issue is how can we not study these cells when they offer such enormous opportunity to, to treat disease, that, that it's really unethical not to study them. But not everybody feels that way. But the issues are, are complicated. There's another complication for some aspects of stem cell research. So for example, when I described nuclear transfer, what you're doing is you're taking a nucleus, for example, from a skin cell or some other cell, and putting it into an egg. But where do you get the egg? You have to get that egg from a woman. The woman has to be a donor, and that woman has to supply the egg, usually after having been treated with certain hormones, and there's a risk to that process. So one has to be very careful not to be doing things uh, that are unethical in terms of egg donors. So you don't want to have egg donors who are simply very poor people um, who are being paid to take a risk so that richer people can take advantage of it. And so you have to be careful about, about issues like that. Those same issues apply now to all of the in vitro fertilization that's done around the world because for that also you need eggs. Sometimes it's from the woman who is going to be a biological mother but oftentimes it's not. And I don't know if it's true here, but in the United States, if you go to any university campus and you read the campus newspaper, you see, ad you see ads for egg donors that people want to pay university students, sometimes fair sums of money, to donate their eggs. And that's going on, and I, I think that's not so good. Um, I think there have to be guidelines and, and regulations that, that control that for in vitro fertilization and similar guidelines that, that control that 
for the use of stem cells. Um, there are such guidelines that have been developed in the U.S. I, I was on the committee that developed the guidelines, so I know them very well. These are very serious issues, and they must be thought through, and they're not black and white. There are arguments on both sides, and one has to decide, you know, personally what's a balance, and then, and then there has to be also a decision societally. Uh, are there places where you want rules, where you want laws, and where do you draw the lines? And those are difficult. They're difficult and they require a lot of thought and a lot of discussion. Um, you've said before that a drug needs to have a balance between um, curing a patient and also not harming the patient at the same time. So um, I'm, I don't have a particular example, but I know that some drugs are extremely toxic, but they at the same time cure people. So do you personally believe that if the drug um, has a potential to cure a disease, but also has known serious side effects, should it be given to the patient to at least try to treat the disease? Yeah, the, the answer to that is sometimes. So if the disease, it's the balance between the threat of the disease, uh, the efficacy of the drug, and the risk of the treatment. So if you have a, a, a disease that is very bad and very quick, okay, so if you, you had a disease that was going to kill you painfully in the next month, and uh, you could take a drug that might cause you, you know, to have some skin discoloration for the next six months, uh, there would be no question. You would take your chance on, on the drug. And, and you, would want to, you would want to have that treatment. On the other hand, if there's a treatment uh, for you know, something that's very minor, um, hair loss, if I can speak of it, you guys are all too young to think about it, but it's something I'm aware of. Um, if there is a treatment for hair loss, but the toxicity was such that there was a 30% chance that drug would kill you, it would be nuts to use it, in, in my view. So it's, it's always a balance. And, and the goal is to maximize the effect, the positive effect of the drug, and minimize the negative effect. And that's what drug companies try to do all the time. And then given what's available at any given moment, uh, there has to be a decision. And I think one of the most important things is to make sure the decision is made by an informed patient. So that if you're the one who's taking the drug, you should be told what is known about how likely it is to help you and what is known about the possible negative consequences. And then you can think about it and decide, yes, I'm willing to take that chance or no, I'm not. Um, so it's, it, it, there's a great variety there. Of, of what you would do in particular cases. It's really what medicine is all about because many drugs do have side effects. Even, even you know, some of the oldest and, and most common, like aspirin. You know, people have argued that given some of the things that aspirin does that are, that's bad, it would have a hard time getting approved in most countries today. But it's been around for a long time and you know, it's not that bad in most cases. Um, but it can be. Um, so is there, is there a relationship between program cell death and coronary artery disease? Uh, and uh, I, I don't know of anything that has been done to demonstrate that, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not the case. Uh, I can think, I can imagine ways that it might be, but I don't know of any data that say that it is. Okay. Um, so, uh, Professor, um, what's your opinion on the U.S. healthcare system? Do you think it's uh, fundamentally broken because of its huge cost compared to uh, the healthcare systems in uh, other rich countries, which provide pretty much the same standard of healthcare? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think the U.S. healthcare system is terrible in its inequalities. Um, at the best of places, the U.S. healthcare system is spectacularly good, but inordinately expensive. And there are many people in the U.S. who do not have adequate health care, cannot afford the private insurance uh, that, that is quite expensive, and do not have jobs uh, at all or jobs that provide them with adequate health care. Um, it just seems to me that a fundamental human right is health care provided by a society. And I, I think that the government has a responsibility to find ways of solving this problem. Healthcare systems around the world vary enormously. And uh, there are models that are good and there are models that are not so good. But I think the U.S. should be a leader uh, in, in this area, and it has not been. So I think, I think it's very important for there to be health care reform. I think it is one of the major goals of the new administration in Washington. But it, like cancer, is complicated. There's not, there's not a quick and easy fix, in part because there's so many institutions that are uh, a part of, of the established way things operate that you can't simply walk in and suddenly say everything's going to be different. You have to figure out, one, what's feasible, and two, how to transition appropriately. But I think the system as it is is not a good system, um, even though the, the health care opportunities are fantastic and, and certainly many of the best hospitals in the world are, are located in the United States. Um, I have a quick question about, back here. Got it. <laughs> um, I'm one of the biology teachers and one of the topics that we discuss is obesity and how large people are getting. And I'm, I'm from the US where it's pretty much endemic. Um, is sometimes weight is due to behavior, but also sometimes weight gain is due to a biochemical issue in the brain. Would what you study, the program Cell Death, would that, could that be used in treating obesity if that's the cause? Yeah, so, so the answer here, again, is that there are a variety of ways that, that one can think about obesity and intervening with obesity, particularly you know, truly clinical obesity, uh, which is very bad. If one looks at, at the studies in the U.S. from the Center for Disease Control, and you look at the amount of obesity as a function of time, you can look at a map of the U.S. state by state, and it is astoundingly upsetting how much this, this has happened uh, over a very short period of time. And you can look on their website, and it would be instructive for the class to do this and see what's happening uh, to a great extent as a consequence of dietary habits and fast foods, which are um, very bad in this respect. Now, in fact, uh, one, one of the major uh, problems with obesity is, is a disorder called fatty liver disease. It's not very well known, even amongst the medical community, but it's becoming much and much better known as, as obesity is rising as, as an area of major clinical concern. And uh, fatty liver disease, it turns out, involves programmed cell death in the liver. And this leads to a change in, in basically liver biology. And one of the compounds that was uh, generated based on the discoveries that I just outlined to block programmed cell death uh, looks like it should be useful for fatty liver disease. So it may well be that a compound derived from the studies that, that we were involved with will be useful to control obesity. But I would argue that, that pharmacological intervention with, uh, with obesity uh, is the secondary goal. What's really needed is education and, and changes in, in the way people eat. And as, as the American diet has been spreading worldwide, 
uh, this American problem, I think, is spreading worldwide as well, and, and I think that's not good. Um, I know there are many interpretations to this question, but it's a more interesting question than like biology. Well, it is biology, but what is, in your opinion, what do you think came first, the chicken or the egg? And why? Okay, so um, more interesting than biology. I don't know about that. Um, that question of chicken and egg arises in many contexts, and, and the answer almost always is neither. Um, you don't have chickens without eggs or eggs without chickens, and evolution works as a continuum. So basically, as organisms evolve, uh, the entire life cycle of the organism uh, evolves in parallel. So you didn't make either one first. Uh, you basically got there through changes from earlier uh, pre-existing organisms that led to both. So it's, it's, not a, it's not an either or. That's not a deep philosophical answer. It's simply a statement of what has to be. To, on behalf of the whole school, I would like to thank Professor Horowitz for a very accessible explanation of some very complex scientific topics. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the International Baccalaureate, but it, it struck me he is a, a great example of the IB learner profile. And many of the attributes which he has shown in his life are the kind of things we're trying to encourage you to do. Not only that, but some of his messages are very pertinent to what you do every day. Things like asking questions about the world, working together as a team, exploring the unknown, and being, not being afraid to try something new. I perhaps should remind you of some of the things that you were doing, like design labs, group work, extended essays, CAS, where you try something new and also the interdependence of all subjects, but particularly the sciences in the Group 4 project. Uh, I was particularly struck by the professor's first comment when uh, he made a distinction between giving answers and giving a response, because that's also really central to theory of knowledge. And something, a message which I hope you are gradually uh, receiving is there are no answers, there are only responses. So, it's been very enlightening for all of us here. Uh, I would really like to give our heartfelt thanks to Professor Horowitz, so thank you very much. Thank you.